Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Benio. Okay, on this episode, big, big, big honor. Um, I was very, very privileged to have a almost two hour conversation with the wonderful, the mighty, the very, very brilliant Douglas Brinkley. Douglas Brinkley is the Catherine Sonoff Brown Chair in Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University. He is a CNN presidential historian and contributing editor at Vanity Fair. He has seven honorary doctorates in American studies. Many of his books have been New York Times uh, bestsellers. He is on the board of trustees at Brevard College and at the Franklin D. Uh, D. Roosevelt Presidential Library. He's a member of the Century Association on the Council of Foreign Affairs, James Madison Council of the Library of Congress. Many, many, many things to say about Douglas Brinkley. His accolades go on and on and on. He is one of our great U.S. historians. He is a wonderful man, and he is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I have been a big fan of, of Douglas's work um, for a while. Um, went back in 2009, he had a book come out that was called The Wilderness Warrior, Theodore Roosevelt and the Crusade for America. My favorite book that year. I, it's about a thousand pages. It's a big one. And I have, you know, I obviously have uh, had a big love for presidents, um, presidential history and biographies. And I had never read a biography on Theodore Roosevelt in this way. It basically looks at the entire life and career of Theodore Roosevelt um, through the lens of conservation and, and how this was you know, the kind of the heartbeat of Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, you don't understand Teddy Roosevelt unless you understand him as someone that wanted to preserve uh, much of the natural uh, environment of the United States. And the book was, was a big, big impact on me. Uh, really left an impact on me. I absolutely loved it. All the biographies I read of Teddy Roosevelt afterwards are kind of with Douglas's uh, book in my mind. Um, and so it's really the standard in a lot of ways. And I was quite uh, uh, excited when I realized uh, a couple years later, there was a, another book that came out called Rightful Heritage, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the Land of America. And a little bit shorter, about 700 some pages. And basically follows the same kind of structure. It's how was Franklin Roosevelt very invested in conservation and really pushing forward uh, sort of environmental policies and really looking at these two presidents who you know i mean fdr took up uh, uh, many many years in the in the in the white house uh, 12 years where he was doing a lot of these 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 things and we were you know we should be grateful to fdr for many of the national parks and forests and wildlife reserves that we enjoy today and you know, so I, I was getting kind of used to this, and sure enough, uh, last year, Douglas put in, out another book uh, in the same vein called Silent Spring Revolution, John F. Kennedy, Rachel Carson, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and the Great Environmental Awakening, which is, you know, an absolute home run. I mean, I still, as I say in the conversation, have no idea how he covered so much ground uh, yes, it's about 900 pages, but so many things going on in uh, late 50s and in the 60s, early 70s, covering you know three presidents, the tremendous work of Rachel Carson. Um, it's a fabulous book. It's absolutely fantastic, and this um, this makes the the trilogy, the conservation trilogy that Douglas has written, and so um, I was very fortunate to have him come on the podcast and talk about his conservation trilogy. So it's, uh, we covered the three books. Um, we covered them uh, big, big themes, uh, even though, you know, again, Douglas gave me very, very uh, generous with his time, uh, almost two hours. Uh, obviously, you cannot cover three books, 2,600 pages in, two, in you know, under two hours, but we tried. <laughs> and we cover many of the, the major themes. So we first started by talking about how he came to write his conservation trilogy. 
we we spend a good about 40 minutes first 40 minutes on teddy roosevelt we talk about understanding the psychology of of teddy roosevelt and how conservation was almost an innate or really critical part of who he was and his early development we talk about his uh, complex relationship with animals that included big game hunting and hunting generally, but also preservation. And Douglas gives a fabulous answer of how to understand both of those. We talk about how Teddy used the federal government as president to protect and preserve parts of the U.S. throughout his two terms. We talk about, then we move to FDR, and we talk about FDR using the federal government again and why that's important for enacting policies to protect forests, build dams, creating recreation areas. Um, we talk about how FDR tied conservation with economical growth, especially during the Great Depression, during World War II. And then we move towards the third book. We talk about Rachel Carson, big impact, you know, Silent Spring, you know, that whole environmental movement in the 60s, how sh she worked with JFK, Stuart Udall, uh, and many of these folks that were really trying to say there are big problems, you know, after, in the wake of, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all of the chemicals that were in many, many places, talking about DDT, all of these things that we really came uh, in awareness of in the 60s. We talk about the environmental justice movement as well. And then we talk about Nixon and how he sees the moment of environmental activism. As we talk about in the conversation, Nixon was not some big, you know, conservation guy his whole life, but we have the EPA, we have NOAA, we have OSHA, we have many clean air, we have many things due to uh, the Congress then and Nixon then. And so it's that first term, especially of Nixon, was, was tremendous as well. And that can't uh, be ignored. We finally end the conversation. We talk about a little bit of some of the advancements that uh, Obama did with uh, some of his policies, especially in first term. We talk about some of the stuff with the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that Biden has done for tackling climate change. And we talk about climate change and energy more broadly in the present moment and where our future is headed and what it would be like or what it would need to be to have a president that really puts that as a priority, as Teddy did, as FDR did, despite all of the, you know, the, the big things going on in the world, that uh, that still is a priority. Again, um, this was an absolute um, highlight for me. Uh, big, big honor to to talk with Douglas. He he said some very kind words as well about the podcast at the end, which I'm I'm very grateful for. Um, but uh, he's he's doing tremendous work. I highly encourage people to support what he does, support by his books, uh, engage. Uh, I know that's what he looks for. I think that's what I look for, and that's what we're all trying to do. So I highly recommend his books. Highly recommend uh, being engaged with the stuff that he's putting out. And uh, as always, you can uh, find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. Get over there. Uh, you can subscribe, contribute if you want. I'm also on YouTube. Uh, share widely. Tell your friends, people that would be interested in this conversation or other conversations I've had. And uh, so now it's, a, it's a, my honor to, to bring my conversation with uh, Douglas Brinkley. I am here with the wonderful, the great Douglas Brinkley. Uh, Doug, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. It's a, it's a big honor, and I, I appreciate you uh, coming on and uh, talking with me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so I have been very much uh, not only impressed, but uh, just admiring the, the absolute magnitude of writing you've put out. I don't know how you write so much and so well. Uh, you have the conservation trilogy uh which is fabulous they are the wilderness warrior theodore roosevelt and the crusade for america this is a this is a big boy it's about almost a thousand pages you had the sequel that came out after that a couple years later called rightful heritage franklin delano roosevelt and the land of america which is also very good and the more recent which came out i believe last year if i'm not mistaken uh silent spring revolution John F. Kennedy, Rachel Carson, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and the Great Environmental Awakening. And that is this one here, also a pretty big one. So the first question I have for you is, 
how did did you intend to write a kind of trilogy? Uh, I know you have a, the one on Alaska somewhere tucked in there as well. So, but how did you come to think of writing this big, grand environmental trilogy about uh, from from the executive office and then how it dictated policy for the United States? Uh, well, I when I was a young professor, um, I got to know Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who had been John F. Kennedy's assistant and most famously wrote a book on Andrew Jackson and then A Thousand Days of JFK and, um, and you know, just so many more, The Vital Center, a biography of Bobby Kennedy. And, and, you know, Arthur told me a couple of things. One was, because I really write about different subjects a lot, he said, I should always declare myself a 20th century American historian, just mm. like their 13th century Italian historians or 19th century British historians. There's nothing wrong with looking at the 20th century in America from a lot of different angles. And, and Arthur, my be- favorite books of his are trilogy he did on FDR and the New Deal. And I started realizing that if Schlesinger can do books just on Roosevelt and the New Deal, I could do a trilogy on the whole history of the environmental movement, uh, which originally, of course, was called Conservation. Uh, But I wasn't sure I'd go through with it all, but I started writing The Wilderness Warrior. Um, I had had the advantage of getting to do research in national park archives and uh, go to places with my kids. Um, so, I, you know, we would go to writing about TR. We'd spend, you know, time up in the Badlands of North Dakota where Theodore Roosevelt lived, or we'd go to the Bighorns of Wyoming, uh, or go to Devil's Tower in Wyoming, which he declared a national monument. So it was really fun from an uh, expeditionary point of view. You know, I get to uh, go, um, go zigzag around the country seeing some of our great natural heirlooms. And um, I always liked T.R. Um, I think historians like him quite a bit because he wrote a lot. Um, historians, we read other people's mail for a living. These are his, you know, we, we look at leavings. And here, Roosevelt wrote like 36 books and 150,000 letters. So mm-hmm. it's a rich trove. And he wrote very well, T.R. He spoke numerous languages and had a poetic grace to his um, writing at, at its best. It also had some you know, heinous turns uh, of um, when it got to dealing with um, indigenous people and, and others. Um, but I don't want to over talk about Theodore Roosevelt mm-hmm. with all um, in, a, in a, with exclamation marks in, in a positive way. But um, I had asthma when I was a boy and I used to sleep with a, a ventilator in fact, sitting here right now, I have air blowing on me, always feeling like I need air. And uh, he had that. And so I identified a little bit with him. And I knew wherever I went and read, you know, he saved so much. I mean, 234 million acres of wild America, public lands for you and me. They belong to everybody. Um, that was Roosevelt um, who started that movement to really define what conservation is during his presidency from 1901 to 1909. In fact, I, I, I'm not, you know, we all fall prey to rankings of things, but when it comes to who was the great environmental president, I always put Theodore Roosevelt first because he really invented the idea of, um, you know, saving endangered species and million acre parks and the like. So I started writing that, but, and it, it did well. It made the New York Times bestseller list got reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review. Um, I knew it was too fat for a, a, a pop marketplace, but nevertheless, it, it hit that. And it encouraged me to continue, uh, which I was hoping I'd be able to do, meaning keeping my publisher, Harper Collins in line to let me do more big fat books on environment. And hence, I took on the next president, the second wave, FDR 1933 to 45 with the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Roosevelt's Tree Army at its core, Mm -hmm. but also FDR during the New Deal created 800 state parks. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the third wave, the big one, um, wasn't about a Roosevelt. It happened to be Rachel Carson at the center as centerpiece, her 1962 book, Silent Spring was a revolution because it connected old-style Rooseveltian 
landscape, conservation, animal protection, and the like. He connected all of that with public health, saying, hey, you, you, know, you may not want to take road trips to go to Yellowstone, but your children are getting sick in their backyard because they're being contaminated by um, you know, toxic debris, uh, particularly from pesticides. And yet Kennedy and Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson and Richard Nixon all played an epic role in what I call the long 60s environmental movement, which ends abruptly in 1973, 50 years ago, almost exactly coinciding with our interview here. The Endangered Species Act had passed the Senate 92 to nothing, mm -hmm. uh, hence saving the bald eagle and the California condor and uh, you know, whooping crane and manatee and on and on. And the fact that's 92 to nothing tells you it really was a revolution, a movement going on in a bipartisan way um, to try to at least beautify America and make sure we, we all of our charismatic species uh, stayed with us, that they didn't uh, go extinct like the dodo bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, the story you're telling is all these themes over the, you know, much of the 20th century. and we obviously have many things going on in our planet now. So I think that these three books are, are uh, fabulous because they, we can look back on our own history, not 200 years ago, but within the past hundred years and see how much this stuff is important, how much we need to be able to say, listen, how can we learn from these things? If you have folks at the top and many, many other players all throughout the cabinet and throughout the public really pushing for these things, um, we we can we can do this, and we can do this in, in, in much better ways for the challenges we have now. The first book, um, the Wilderness Warrior, I, when that came out in two thousand nine, I mean that was my favorite book I read all all year oh, that year. It it really was. It, it it pushed me to really consider a lot of the things with national parks. I've been to many since. I've been to Teddy Roosevelt Park in North Dakota, Badlands in South Dakota. Uh, many, many, many of them out in the West Glacier and Yellowstone and Tetons. So it's really cool to see when you're there, you can see, hey, you know what? This is because of many of the actions that many people did, but that people, uh, certain presidents took this serious and they took this as important for, for the public uh, and seen uh, different iterations of that over you know, many, many, many decades. So it's, it's very, really, really important. And with, with Theodore Roosevelt, I want to ask here, so what is it about the psychology of, of Teddy that helps us understand his innate passion almost for the environment? I mean, yes, he's well-loved. He was, you know, a vice president. He was a governor. He was president. Uh, he ran you know, almost, you know, you had a good chance in, in 1912. Um, he was really much instantiated in public life. But I mean, after reading Wilderness Warrior and other great books that have come out on him, I almost don't see him as a president first anymore. I almost see him as this person that is very much an environmentalist that really cared about preservation uh, first, and then using that you know uh, kind of power in that way to 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 push those conservation principles. So, what is it about him? Do you think that really just kind of sunk into him, and that was kind of this you know burning passion he had for for his personal life and his political life throughout his career? Well, it, you just asked, I think, the best question you could about Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and it's one I've thought about and I, I understand. Um, he grew up very sickly. I mentioned asthma, but he was very sick. Those days, um, you know, he was born in 1858 in New York City. Um, and, you know, he was, they would give you cigarettes to smoke for your asthma. Nobody knew, you know, uh, what was going on, what it was in New York City. It was unregulated factories spewing, um, you know, smoke and, and the like into the streets, and uh, people would cough, get sick. Uh, there were uh, rotting, rotted horses. Uh, there were no humane laws, so people willy-nilly could shoot a stray dog or a cat or kill robins. Uh, and T.R.'s father uh, was very sensitive to the natural world, and his father was the progenitor of today's American Museum of Natural History. He mm -hmm. conceptualized it, he fundraised for it, he wanted people to understand the natural world. Most impressively, Darwin's On the Origin of Species came out in 1859. 
when TR was one years old. And, and of course, we're saying 59, then we're falling into the Civil War of the 1860s, and very few people were hung up on Darwin in the middle of the Civil War. Mm-hmm. But the Roosevelt household was. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's father was an arch believer in Darwin and the theory of evolution and, you know, um, what are the earliest writings of young, uh, uh, the future president are him showing his brother evolving from a stork or him, him you know, evolving from a dog. And so they were a Dar- Darwin household. And that was a revolutionary book on the origins of species. Theodore Roosevelt carried that book in his saddlebag or trunk wherever he went. It was really a Bible for him. Uh, TR was very science driven, but particularly the studying of floral and, uh, and fauna. But maybe trying to emulate his dad a little. As a boy, he started collecting bird's nest and the like in New York City and leaves and became a budding naturalist. Um, he ended up going to Harvard and majoring in what we call naturalist studies. Uh, but his first book is indicative of the key to your question. He wrote as an undergraduate a book called The Summer Birds of the Adirondacks. Uh, that was really beyond the love of bird wa- uh, watching. Uh, he would leave New York City and go to the Catskills or the Adirondacks, and he felt, felt that it was like um, it, his health just improved mightily. He felt it was a curative. Uh, T.R. always believed clean air, natural world. Uh, we gave you what you know today you call you know uh, mindfulness or uh, could clear your head, de-stress you, but also had benefits to your health in general, um, and that stays with them throughout his life. So it believe it believes the power of the natural world, and it's sort of like a pantheist or something. I mean, these are the temples of of God's temples for Roosevelt. He was not an indoor church man. He he loved being outdoor, and sometimes when he travel, he do a a Sunday service out out in the woods. Um, but he followed Henry David Thoreau's footsteps. He went up to Maine, uh, to Cahaden, uh, the the famous mountain in Maine, where you know he climbed and he went went looking for moose. And you know he those were Thoreau was a hero, Darwin a hero, John James Audubon. And then when he graduated from Harvard, he went west to a place called Carroll County, Iowa, westernmost Iowa. He went grouse hunting, and there he fell in love with the, the um, there was still some tall grass prairie existing. Uh, he fell in love with the, um, the, the great savanna, the great plains. Um, he also went up to Fargo, Moorhead, um, in you know, North Dakota, Minnesota. And he started just wanting to write and get paid for writing about nature and animals, hunting. Um, and when his um, mother and wife died, deep depressive moment. He, he was a legislator in New York and got a telegram. Your mom's sick from his brother, Elliot, mother's sick. Um, and your wife is sick in childbirth. He took the train into Manhattan. It was still, you know, gaslit, no electricity. And in the same home, he would shuttle between two floors. And that Valentine's Day, his mother died of Bright's disease, and his wife died um, giving, giving birth. So he lost the two loves of his life. He gave them a dual burial at a cemetery in Wall Street. And then you can almost feel or see the pen cutting the paper in his diary. It's just a giant X. It says, the light has gone out of my life forever. He was stewing in depression. And depression was in the Roosevelt family. In fact, Elliot, who sent that, that Western Union telegram to him, his brother ended up throwing himself out a window. Had problems with um, you know, opiates and alcohol. Um, there, there was a very uh, a depressive depression strain in the family. And wisely, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's loving sister said, look, go west um, and, you know, where you're happiest, get out of here, get, heal your depression. And so he took the Northern Pacific Railroad to where you went, Medora, North Dakota, in the Badlands, and there spent his years in the wild, so to speak. He, he created a couple of cattle brands, the uh, Elkhorn and the Maltese. Um, they, they, you know, were marginally okay, but with winners and all, never really turned it into an effective business. But he wrote beautifully. Still, nobody's written about the Little Missouri River or 
and the cottonwood country or um you know parts of um of the rockies with the beauty of theodore roosevelt and uh, he's just he really decided a couple of uh, epiphanies when he was up there one is when he went to hunt a buffalo we used to have 60 you know million buffalo thundering around the the, the plains so there were once buffalo all through you know illinois and indiana mm-hmm. and they were down to a thousand and he couldn't find one it took him a week and he did shoot one and did this sort of native american you know a sioux sort of dance around the carcass kept the head as a trophy which is at his home in sagamore hill but decided that he was going to bring back the disappearing species and form groups like the boone and crockett club american bison society and much more and started even trying and trying to breed in captivity bison to re-release onto the prairie he wrote a book while he was president about the deer families of america he um worked to you know have uh, to study elk um all over you know and he and he regularly wrote what we would call kind of peer reviewed type of articles uh, about species right before he died he wrote one on the gopher tortoises of florida he went and participated in a rattlesnake handling ceremony in arizona looking at rattlesnakes he died in his bed while he was writing a piece about pheasants so he was what edwin uh edward o. wilson at harvard called biophilic um that is somebody who has to have the natural world in his life needs to have living creatures around him um, to to order to function and to heal well at any time in tr's life he had 50 60 pets mm-hmm. and i don't mean stored away in a garage mm-hmm. i mean actively moving around him um and i'm only going a little long in this question because the payoff is what what i talked to dr k jameson who was the head of psychiatry at johns hopkins about theodore roosevelt and she, you know, does sees him as like a Tigger big figure in Winnie the Pooh, but more to the point um, that he had in her mind manic depression. Mm-hmm. Now, when you we hear the word depression, you immediately think you're you're dreary. You know, it just makes you think that. But manic depression, probably the best kind of depression to get, but it's a coping mechanism where he framed everything positive every minute in front of him. So when you read transcripts or speeches, it's always, what a beautiful day. So great to be talking to you. Isn't the sky lovely? Uh, without this deep reflection of self, just kind of an onward motion based on a kind of manic positivism and, or we can do it. And, that, you know, and, um, and he, then he add to that, he drank a gallon of coffee a day um, and did not drink alcohol because of, you know, worried about addiction in the family. Um, and he was a pretty wired guy. Uh, problems he had was insomnia, and one of the great issues of being having man being manic depressive is you know he really couldn't shut his mind off, mm-hmm. and um, and that thing kept going. He didn't know how to switch it. In fact, today he would be prescribed Ambien or something to mm-hmm. help him rest, but he would just read, read, read into the wee hours. And so uh, people with manic depression like himself tend to exhaust himself. It's amazing he lived to make 60. He lived to 60. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was burning the, the uh, you know, candle at both ends, trying to live every day to its utter fullness. And, um, and hence, you know, he, the hiking, um, going in, when, you know, he, we study him, his travels in Africa or Brazil, or, that's what kept him going. And you, you said the most perceptive thing, just like Thomas Jefferson at his grave doesn't say he was president of the United mm-hmm. States. He'll say founder of the University of Virginia, you know, uh, author of the Declaration of Independence, uh, et cetera. Uh, with TR, really, it just has nothing on his gravestone, just the years. But first and foremost, he saw himself as a naturalist explorer in the Darwin tradition of doing field research in the wild. And his big thing he most loved was trying to create guidebooks if you like of what was west of the mississippi because nobody knew what kind of butterflies were in arizona or you know what, what were the you know um what what type of uh, trees were in um in utah 
oh, we hadn't done that. We haven't inventoried our holdings. And so he was really a, uh, a biologist you know, of the West that was looking to categorize and document North American species. Yeah, I mean, and when you think about that, you think about, you know, you, you capture so well the kind of essence of him. When you think about that, you think, well, wow, this kind of person who was so dedicated to all of these things ended up being the president, you know, really pushing various uh, policies. So I, I do want to get to his, his, uh, ter- his two terms, um, but I do want to ask one question here. Uh, you, you mentioned it, so I'm, I'm curious about this. He has an, a complex view of animals, and I, and I know some folks, you know, in current day have questions about this. He was a hunter, but he believed in animal rights. He was a committed taxidermist. How did he have this kind of seemingly, uh, you know, kind of two views of animals where they should be protected, um, but also he went on big game hunts, as you, as you mentioned. For many people, that would seem as a contradiction. Um, how, do, how do we understand his kind of complex view of, uh, and his mindset towards, towards animals and preserving them, but also uh, hunting and, and killing them as well? Well, yeah, to your point, he was a lifetime member of the Audubon Society and the National Rifle Association. You don't usually see those two in sync, although, you know, uh, NRA back then was different than it is, mm-hmm. is today. I'm not sure he would have joined it today. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm quite certain he wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, but the, the, um, it, we didn't have DNA there uh, back in the 18, let's call it eight, after the Civil War, let's say 1870s. Um, 1880s. There was no DNA. There wasn't bird banning. Uh, we we weren't able to um, film the uh, m- migratory patterns of eels underwater or you know um, birds in the sky. Uh, and so, if you were interested in ornithology or mammalogy, uh, botany, you collected. And in that case, you would shoot the species to study it. And at the Natural uh, American Museum of Natural History, I've gone through, and they, they've saved them. They're all tagged. You can mm-hmm. pull out the drawers of the birds wow. that Roosevelt shot. Their, their bodies are there. And that, what they were trying to determine is beak variation or coloration. Is it a species or subspecies? Um, you know, it was trying to uh, understand scientifically what existed with the long-term idea of being able to perhaps help that animals survive. Uh, Roosevelt was very concerned about extinction of species. He would say losing one type of, of sparrow or one type of you know, lizard would be like slashing all the Rembrandts and destroying them, that these were the great um, um, you know, gifts to the world, these animals. And, and he even worked with a friend and they made a tombstone drawing and started putting all the species that humans had destroyed. For example, when John Adams was president, there were a billion passenger pigeons, Mm -hmm. a billion in Mm -hmm. the United States. Um, The last one died in 1913, named Martha, at the Cincinnati Zoo. So animal extinction was a concern. Um, And so that's the legitimate view as a scientist. But I think something more was there. I do think he had a kind of hunter bloodlust. I think he enjoyed um, the, the, the being out and about and looking for an animal and getting to look at it up close. Uh, I, th- I feel that he oversampled, overkilled uh, at times in his life. There are also moments when he claims, I'm putting the gun down, I don't need it anymore. And so it's a whole thing. But yeah, um, it, it's, um, you know, and. You also remember when you're in politics, which he was, I mean, guns were everywhere. Look at the issue today as a Second Amendment, you know, fight. Uh, I, I, I spoke with Barack Obama personally a number of times after some of the school shootings, and he was working around the clock trying to uh, do away with the, the selling of semi-automatic weapons. And he told me, look, it's easy to be Michael Bloomberg in New York City saying ban guns. I'd like to see Bloomberg go to Kentucky and try to tell people to get rid of these weapons. Uh, it's cultural in Texas. So Roosevelt uh, was part of a kind of 19th century gun culture, particularly with that frontier ethos that, that um, stayed there. But what he really has going for him, and it, it comes to educating himself, 
is he was one of the few politicians. I only really, I looked once and I, I know there was one other one, a congressman named John Lacey, but very few people in the public arena um, understood that at back, let's say 1900, that the world was one pulsing biological organism, that it was all interconnected. Mm. And you need to know the great writer, Aldo Leopold, um, who wrote Sand County Almanac, was working and would create our first official kind of wilderness in the Gila wilderness of New Mexico. Leopold wrote Roosevelt a letter as just a young guy were out in New Mexico uh, about his TR's environmental views. And, um, and Roosevelt wrote Leopold back to this letter and said, you, you're, you're spot on. That's the right way. You know, I think if you really want to understand the hunting mind of Theodore Roosevelt, the best place is to read the 1949 classic, A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, because mm. intellectually, uh, Roosevelt and Le Leopold's view of the world are, are deeply intertwined. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's very instructive, because I think for many people uh, in a current day, they may see that as confusing, but I think your, your, many of your initial points are, are, are very, very helpful in, in trying to understand that. So about who has president, so I'll set this up and, and give you some runway here. Um, so he becomes president. He's you know, the youngest uh, president um, uh, due to McKinley being assassinated. And you know, coming in, you have you know, turn of the century. It was an interesting time uh, for the United States and a lot of challenges. And it's interesting because he uses the office of the presidency uh, to have significant influence on conservation programs, which you would think, well, wait a minute, there's, there's a lot of stuff on foreign affairs, there's stuff here in the country. Someone, uh, a president was just assassinated, it was the uh, third president that was assassinated. And why is he, 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 he pushing for this? So specifically on this, again, you can, you can talk about both terms. Um, the first kind of sub-question here is, why did he use because I think this is essential. Why did he want to use the federal government to enact these preservation reforms? Because using the private sector could have had a whole different kind of outcome on how we do things. And it, he really used the power and the might of the federal government. Um, and he does, does this in things like the 1906 Antiquities Act. You can talk about the crowded hour of 1908, making all these national forests and, and, and uh, forest sites, which is really incredible. So just kind of say over his two terms why he wanted to use the federal uh, government to enact so many of the things that, that he did. Uh, as a quick aside, you know, one of the great points of confusion in our country is the role of the president. How much power does a president have? Mm -hmm. You know, in all of our uh, foundational documents, be it, you know, certainly the, the U.S. Constitution or the Federalist Papers, Bill of Rights. Uh, there's nowhere that we give these presidents executive power to do these, you know, executive orders. Mm -hmm. um, George Washington did issue one for neutrality, uh, which started a, a, a precedent, but that was like, you know, a, a one-off thing. Um, so it wasn't used much, but, but, but some people will call Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of Freeing the Slaves as executive order number one. Um, and that meant a lot to TR. He loved Lincoln and that Lincoln could free end slavery with an executive edict. He didn't see any reason he couldn't save the Grand Canyon with one. Um, and so, you know, it used to be called the executive mansion. It, it only becomes the White House when Theodore Roosevelt named it as that. And his presidency is the beginning of, of it using executive power to circumvent uh, Congress um, and, you know, the Senate. Uh, both houses. So here are the mechanisms. Uh, first off, understand always Theodore Roosevelt put the United States first. Mm. He did not like states' rights. He believed in a big, strong federal government. He was suspicious of corporations. Um, in fact, he, when he, he weighed in on a big labor dispute and ended up uh, siding with the workers, the labor movement. Um, when, you know, the end of his life, he was a beloved figure with labor leaders and People like Gene Adams, the social worker, and W.E.B. Du Bois of uh, the NAACP loved Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, 
He was a, became very progressive, but at the key to him is the federal government's where the power is. Mm-hmm. And on the natural world, for example, if you want to create a national park, you have to go through Congress. You can't circumvent it for a park. So he did save Crater Lake in Oregon, one of my favorite parks, incidentally, but Crater Lake in Oregon or Mesa Verde in Colorado or Wind Cave in South Dakota and others. Uh, that went through Congress and he just backed it, pushed it, gave it momentum. Uh, but what made him unique was when he goes to the Grand Canyon and he's surrounded by Rough Riders, the men, the soldiers who served with him in the Spanish-American War. It's the people that thought of him as Colonel Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. And there he is at that, the canyon as backdrop. And he says, do not touch it. God has made it. You will only mar it. Leave the Grand Canyon alone. And when he, he does that, he, he decides to take as you say, an elastic piece of legislation called the Antiquities Act of 1906, not much more than a paragraph, that was meant to save dinosaur bones that were being discovered in the West uh, because European museums were poaching and stealing our, our, our antiquities, meaning somebody would find a T-Rex in you know, Wyoming, they would start trying to lift the bones for a museum in Berlin. So the Congress and the Antiquities Act said we can kind of create like an archaeological dig site, and in the name of science, that belongs to the American people. Mm -hmm. And it applied to Kivas and, you know, Hopi Village and, and, you know, certain um, cliff-dwelling areas, um, you know, out in the West when we're starting to understand Native culture in a new way. And Roosevelt applies that to um, the Grand Canyon, what was maybe... And Spirit Antiquities Act may have been for 10 acres. He's applying it for what will become over a million acres. Mm-hmm. And he d- does it with an executive order because the Senate wanted to mine the Grand Canyon. They didn't want it as a national park. It was thought too large and that nobody would go there and it should be used for mining, zinc, asbestos, copper, timber. Uh, so it goes to the courts. And in the court case, uh, um, as it goes through our system, Roosevelt wins. And it showed that he did have the right to use executive power to save the Grand Canyon. I mean, and then he's off to the races. I mean, he's signing 18 of these things, you know, Muir Woods, Redwood Trees, and, you know, Devil's Tower, I mentioned, you know, the the incredible monument in Wyoming, on and on and on signing them. So that was one mechanism. Hmm. So uh, second is um, he had, look, birds, you can't have state conservation laws for birds. I mean, you can do all you want in Massachusetts to be protect your bird life. If they migrate to Florida and they were, they get shot, mm-hmm. uh, and so it, it basically screamed federal intervention. And he found out that down in um, the Indian River in Florida, um, near a town called Sebastian, um, uh, on the Atlantic coast, they were uh, they were feather mafias, the big fashion and say 1901, um, mm-hmm. where uh, women would wear ornamental feathers in their bonnet or dead hummingbirds at times. Um, and it, it was a big lucrative business. And the feather mafia would just go to rookeries, kill all the birds, take the eggs and pluck the prettiest, you know, heron feather, egret feather um, and the like. And, uh, and it was still like a, a very much a Confederate state, Florida. It was the wild. Uh, mm-hmm. It was deeply anti-federal government in Florida. Um, this isn't that many decades after the Civil War. And Roosevelt has some lawyers that he talks to about the bird problem because he's always talking to ornithologists. In this case, a man named Frank Chapman informed him about the slaughter of the birds in Florida. And Roosevelt then pounded his fist and said, I so declare it a, a, a federal bird reservation, the whole area off limits to human encroachment. Well, this wasn't just federally land grabbing, grabbing this, it deeded it to to birds. It Mm -hmm. said no humans can go there. It's actually, we're putting real estate as a place for restoration and habitat for species. And after he did Pelican Island uh, Federal Bird Reservation in Florida, he then did 51 of these. And so we, it's the birth of U.S. fish and wildlife. You and I are talking here and we share something. We own 550 plus of um, wildlife refuges, national wildlife refuges all over our country. 
ones that Roosevelt saved, like Yukon Delta in Alaska, it's this, the land mass for species is as large as the state of West Virginia. Wow. And, and so now we're doing all this, putting the species above humans. Um, and, and only scientists or photographers or people with a purpose and permit could go and, and, and live there. There would be no mining, timbering, and on. And that's a revolution in its own. Yeah. And then third, um, he, his great friend Gifford Pinchot uh, believed in utilitarian forestry, but scientific forestry, uh, which in the idea is if you're going to chop down, uh, that, that there was a technique to using uh, cutting trees. You just don't clear cut. The hillside, you have to do it in ways that will keep keep the forest alive, and um, and so he knows that Congress is not going to allow this, you know, 150 plus national forests that are being mapped out, and he uses the summer July one date when uh, Congress was in recess, and anticipating he was going to be defeated on his national forest, used executive power and saved 150 of them. So. You pull a map of America and look at the national parks, monuments, wildlife refuges of, you know, of, of, of TR, it, it, it's astounding. And it's all because of what you said. He said conservation of our natural resources is the number one job of a president. Mm-hmm. He put that on par and even ahead of national security, military. Uh, it was that much of a passion for him. And, you know. Hence, it's kind of fitting that he has a symbol, the teddy bear, uh, which <laughs> is the most popular toy in the world, uh, yeah. um, as his, you know, um, as the, his, his relic uh, that, you know, keeps on living. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you read all of this stuff, and, you, and, and for folks that, that don't have the book and, and should have the book, in The Wilderness Warrior, you have, uh, I think it's in the appendix in the back, you know, you have a couple of maps that show... Um, the national forest uh, created the bird reservations, game preserves, on and on, and it's 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 numerous. It's amazing, and how and yet, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of of Teddy Roosevelt. There is this interesting dynamic, and I was very curious to to ask you about this that he had with Native Americans. Now, now, many people will say, "Well, look, this is great that he's." preserving wildlife and, and forest and many, many landmarks in the United States, but this is native land. And, and to come in and, and to do this, you know, when the West was still being cultivated in, in, in many ways, uh, in, in, you know, kind of treacherous ways against Native Americans, how do you understand the important conservation work that he did um, but squaring that with this kind of aspect of, well, this land belonged to natives. How did he work uh, alongside them? Was there any conflict? Was it just kind of, I declared this and that's it, doesn't matter who's living there? Or did he really try to work with Native Americans in different places uh, in, in, in these parts all over the, the country, especially in the West? Um, well, of course, you know, when you, we all know, but we even use our marker of, of Colombian, or, I mean, uh, pre-Columbian or, you know, post-Columbian, meaning that uh, 1492 in the beginning of, uh, of Euro-Americans coming to North America, it's, it's storied. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it can be explained as a genocide of people that, mm-hmm. that uh, white Europeans came and uh, took land, did illegal land deals, uh, um, uh, massacres of Native people. It's part of our history uh, yeah. and you you have so much great scholarship on each tribe and what occurred and what happened uh roosevelt's views on and i'm going to use the word native american not indigenous uh, although they're interchangeable in many mm-hmm. ways but for native people um roosevelt's view was um at one hand he romanticized them which is always a dangerous uh, mm-hmm. meaning he had, he he loved their way they, they lived and with uh, subsistence farming, the way that they uh, uh, hunted and gathered. He loved their art, their traditions. He read about them. I would say very few Americans knew more about the um, Native tribes than Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, mm-hmm. And as I later, as I said, he lived for a while with, in a Hopi village and lived with them. On the other hand, 
he believed in manifest destiny that the um, that it was the United States's job to settle from coast to coast, and that native people needed to um, either Christianize or or uh, or if not that um, become part of um, the, the the thing that's bigger than being a, a Sioux or a, a Ute or or Apache, which is being an American. And this creates um, mixed results. Um, first off, make no mistake about it, he wrote a book called The Weaning of the West, which the main heroes are the, the, you know, the, the, the settling of the West by the Euro-Americans. Um, but, but then he will, um, you know, it, it gets, you know, he would invite Native Americans to participate in his inaugural, for example, in 1904, his parade was all, you know, native tribes and, and uh, from all over that would be in his parade. Yet he declared other native leaders like Geronimo a terrorist. Mm. So again, there's two way, two camps for Roosevelt, you know. Um, and then um, he he would go um, and, you know, I mean, there, he was great friends with, for example, Quanta Parker, the chief of the Comanche. Who you know fought in and and but Parker uh, became a Christian. He started wearing suits, mm. um, and you know became great friends with Roosevelt. In fact, President Roosevelt and Quanta Parker together brought buffalo from the Bronx Zoo that T.R. had helped uh, raise with proper grasses and things to eat, and brought them by train to Wichita Mountain, Oklahoma, and together ceremoniously released the. Bison, so because the native, the Plains tribes believed that the buffalo had disappeared, but someday they would re, re come out of this sacred mountain. There's a president of the United States doing something like that. Um, but I think he, by and large, um, fell into an idea of what today we're calling white superiority that uh, intellectually, the great achievements of the world. Uh, modernity and, and progress had come out of the European uh, countries and that the, the, the native people weren't, uh, weren't, had not developed uh, intellectually and they needed to. Um, and so there's racism, um, is what I'm saying, um, in, yeah. in Roosevelt's record with Native uh, Americans. Is there with other presidents? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the way it was in the United States. But Roosevelt disappoints more because he he was so understood so much mm -hmm. um, um, that you would have hoped that there would have been a a, a different way of looking at things. Hence, um, you know, the New American Museum of Natural History had a statue of Roosevelt on his horse, and yeah. it's kind of paternal. He's like yeah. patting a, 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 a indigenous American or African on that. You know, that's a It's not it's not butchering. But yeah. it's it's a paternal kind of feeling, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, that's the way it was back then. That's the way he was, and so when we call balls and strikes in history, we have to put that yeah. in the margin of failed in his relations with native people. Yeah, no, I, I I like the the honest assessment there, and I think I think that's right. As much as we like him for a lot of things, we have to be. I, I agree, balls and strikes on it, and you know, I think thankfully we progress from from some of those notions and and still much progress to make but i think that's that's important i want to shift to the second book um and too many things to talk about in the second book there's so many things that happen um uh, fdr was um i mean prolific in many things that he did so i'm gonna i'm gonna ask kind of two questions here at the same time so i'm just gonna jump right to him as president so you mentioned that he had three major tasks for the federal government for managing public domain, uh, also emphasizing the federal government for managing public uh, land. Uh, and those three are protecting forests, huge, he was huge on this, protecting forests, building public dams, establishing recreation areas. And there are so many things that he did in the first term in, in 33, with Civilian Conservation Corps, Soil Conservation Service, Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, public Works Administration, all of these, I mean, amazing things. 
Um, and they, they towards, this, uh, I think, in the fourth term or third or fourth term, they actually uh, kind of, you know, become defunded of sorts. So there's this period of uh, a solid, you know, eight years or 10 years where they really were very helpful in revitalizing the country. How did he, again, also want to use the federal government, but how did he do things a little bit differently than his, his cousin, Teddy, um, and how he wanted to uh, organize and kind of govern how uh, the United States in the 30s and 40s, again, right in the middle of war, in the middle of depression, was still placing an emphasis on this, tying it with economic uh, prosperity. How was his vision for, for kind of you know, navigating and doing these things? Well, if it wasn't for Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt, our country would be a bunch of strip malls and interstates mm. mm-hmm. and, uh, and, you know, open pit mines. Um, they brought this sense of preservation, of, of planning. Both Theodore and uh, Franklin believed in, like, in urban areas where you kept green belts mm. around cities and made sure you had a, a um, city beautiful movement to keep parks it became to them uh, the essential um, of, of, for our nation's uh, history that, you know, Theodore Roosevelt and FDR both believed, you know, that, you know, the, the French have the Louvre and, you know, we have the Tetons or, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, London has the Seine, but, or I mean, the Thames and, and you know, we have the Hudson or uh, they just saw our natural features as being, uh, being, you know, what it is to be an American is to protect those. Um, and it was should have been a right to have wilderness or outdoor bars, parks in your life. Uh, FDR grew up along the Hudson River um, and died on the Hudson River. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt used to say his life blood is the Hudson. Mm. Uh, it's like 300 and you know, plus miles down uh, the, the Hudson, one of the most beautiful rivers anywhere. Mm. And Roosevelt fell in love with it the same way the Hudson Valley landscape painters did. Um, the same way Washington Irving had the, you know, it, it's just beautiful there. Yeah. And he early on adopted Theodore Roosevelt's conservation um, edicts as his own. But his bigger interest, they, what they deeply shared were bird watching. Both were, were obsessive ornithologists. Uh, in fact, Theodore Roosevelt, not because he was famous, but he was one of the best ornithologists alive mm. in his lifetime, period. And some said nobody understood birdsong better than Theodore Roosevelt. Um, it was the rap of the professional uh, ornithological community. Mm-hmm. Um, so they both shared that, but um, FDR liked trees a lot. He actually, whenever you look at an application of Roosevelt, when they, you know, like we all fill out, you know, uh, it says, what's your job or occupation? He would always write tree farmer. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't being sarcastic. Um, he was trying to make a living at his tree plantation and, along the Hudson, and you can go there now and, and look at it. In fact, as president, he would take out ads in the New York Times and elsewhere where it would say, have a New Deal Christmas, get a tree from Roosevelt Farm. He was growing Christmas trees. Um, and, the, um, and he connects with Gifford Pinchot, who created Yale School of Forestry and was TR's um, protege. And, and Pinchot was really tight with the Roosevelts. And so there became a movement of scientific forestry. They have to make sure, because remember, it's not about the aesthetic value of the trees. It's if you kill it, you'll, you know, uh, if you destroy a mountainside, you'll get runoff and it'll create flooding. And it, it'll, it has a chain reaction. And, you know, um, and so he falls into that deeply. Um, he, he, you know, like Theodore Roosevelt, also loves the U.S. Navy, um, and they share a lot. I like to say, you know, um, Theodore Roosevelt from New York, FDR's from New York. Theodore Roosevelt was a state legislator, FDR was a state legislator. Theodore Roosevelt went to Harvard, FDR goes to Harvard. Theodore Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, FDR's Assistant right. Secretary of the <laughs> Navy. Theodore Roosevelt's Governor of New York, FDR's Governor of New York. Theodore Roosevelt loved conservation, scientific forestry, parks, FDR loves them. Theodore Roosevelt has a niece called Eleanor and uh, Roosevelt, and FDR marries her, uh, meaning they, they, they're in sync. And, and conservation is everything. 
So we cut to when once he get he contracted polio FDR in 1921 um, with Boy Scouts uh, at a Boy Scout jamboree. Uh, he was swimming and hiking, playing horseshoes with all of these underserved young people from Patterson, New Jersey, and the Bronx and all who went up the Hudson to uh, Bear Mountain State Park. And there in the water, he contracted the polio virus. He manifested itself a few days later. And, and after a horrible migraine and night sweats, he woke up uh, with no feeling in the lower half of his body. Uh, and at that point, they got him into a hospital and it was determined he had polio. That was the plague. If you were declared a polio, and that's what they were called, Nobody wanted to be near you in the same room. It was thought to be contagious. Mm. So a man who was so popular, Franklin Roosevelt, handsome political star, suddenly is sitting at, at his home um, in Springwood at the, at, along the Hudson, and nobody would come visit him. Mm. Nobody wanted to be with the polio. And he ended up going to the Florida Keys, Everglades, bird watching, uh, and recording uh, natural observations. He then went to Georgia and bought an area to create a resort for polio in Thermal Springs. The thought being hydro power uh, helped, you know, had a healing effect on people with polio. Everybody kind of wrote Roosevelt off, but they don't also often mention in the 1920s he was running the State Park Association, demanding that every state has to create park systems. Then when he finally comes back uh, and becomes governor of New York, uh, it used to be two terms, I mean, two years. So he won in 1928, he won again in, in 30, and in 32, he, um, is, he runs for president as the New Deal. His most successful program as governor was a model of what becomes the Civilian Conservation Corps, meaning taking unemployed people, paying them a fee, dollar a day, and having them restock ponds with fish, having them, um, you know, uh, plant trees, having them beautify, um, you know, cityscapes, having them uh, build roads to get to historic sites, whatever it might be. But it was about n improvement through nature. Um, and the, it's his pet project of the New Deal. He does it right after his famous, I have nothing to fear but fear, fear itself inaugural. and. Um, from 1933 to 1942, the New Dealers, under Roosevelt's leadership, plant close to 3 billion trees. Billion it's incredible. Around America. It's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. And they're going everywhere. They're fighting CCC camps all over mm -hmm. and repairing our burned out land. We had, we had drained the wetlands. We had chopped all the hardwood trees without replanting. We had a dust bowl conditions in the Great Plains, a great ecological catastrophe on and on. And so Roosevelt's coming back to save America, not just save capitalism, but also to lit literally save and restore our um, denuded and degraded landscapes. And he did it. And mm. in addition, he continues the national park trend of TR, you know, saving iconic places like Isle Royal National Park in Michigan or Mammoth Cave, Channel Islands, Olympics. Great Smokies, Everglades, on and on. Um, but he also um, is deep on animal um, in, in, in wildlife protection. A, a, in, in a place called Henry's Lake, Idaho, it's right on the border of by near Yellowstone. Uh, this was where the trumpeter swans winter because that lake doesn't freeze because it's warm water. So it was their winter um, habitation spot. And, they, and instead of migrating, they would stay there. Well, the 10th Mountain Division, it cost $25 million back in the World War II era. That is a fortune today. I mean, 25 mil. And they were building it to train American soldiers how to go to, say, the Alps and, do, and, and, um, and train with skiing and uh, combat in the snow and all of this going on at Henry's Lake. And it was, it was disturbing the swans. They were fleeing, scattering, helter-skelter. Um, and a woman named Rosalie Edge informed Roosevelt that the U.S. Army was going to lead to the extinction of the trumpeter swan. And Roosevelt, who should have just thrown that letter away, 
he's a busy man, this is Pearl Harbor time, mm -hmm. he gets a hold of his Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, and says, I want a full report, I'm going to look into this. And he found, he then writes Stimson after doing his homework, I've looked into the battle between the U.S. Army and the Trumpeters, and I side with the Trumpeters. The U.S. Army must, uh, must uh, re-nest. Mm. FDR. He booted and closed the, 20, the 10th Mountain Division training facility and moved it to Camp Hale in Colorado simply to save the Trumpeter swans. Mm. Why? Because he believed that, that, it, that it was symbolic that we are not going to molest our, our protected wilderness, forest, uh, wildlife sanctuaries uh, under a gouge because of World War II. That what we were fighting for in the Pacific in Europe was the American landscape, was the ability to disappear into the wild, was the ability to have beautiful trees and butterflies and live a good life. And so he wasn't going to um, start undoing those federal accomplishments um, simply because uh, for expediency's sake, for quick lumber, or, you know, um, quick iron ore. Um, and that's how ardent of environmental-minded uh, uh, president we had in FDR. Hmm. I guess a, a kind of follow-up on that is, in many ways, there was a kind of um, a, a, a preservation or an awareness that Teddy kind of puts forward early on in the 20th century. But with FDR, I see him building off of that and using, by creating whole big programs right? Teddy yeah. didn't do that as much. It was a lot of let's protect, yes. but there was with FDR, big, 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 big federal programs that were able to save 180 million acres of woodlands in 40 States and 140 million waterfowl and one third of America's uh, forest lands and planting all of those trees and connecting it economically. I mean, how much in terms of policy, I mean, you talk about it in the book, we don't have to talk about it here, but, you know, Harold uh, Ickes was, was huge. He obviously had Congress that was passing things. He's creating all of these big, big federal programs. And we just don't see a lot of that today, right? We don't, or, or, or less so. And how much was, you know, because obviously he was president for many years, how much does all of that federal all those federal programs and the policies enacted in the 30s and 40s have all of these repercussions in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Even something like Water Conservation with Clean Rivers Act, you know, finally gets passed by LBJ in 65. Like we're seeing these like implications federally in his policies. Maybe just chat about how that brand of, of preservation and conservation was, was really critical uh, from, from FDR's uh, uh, you know, administration. Yeah. Well, I just, you just, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt used to say to, uh, to environmentalists, um, and, and they, that, that the term environmental is not really used till around the Earth Day 1970, but, uh, uh, but you know, conservation is preservationist. But the, um, you know, I'll just give you two examples. Mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor used to say, if, if, uh, my husband is a sucker for beautiful landscape photos. If you want to save some acreage with the federal government, get an appointment with him and show him booklets of beautiful photographs. And Harold Ickes knew this was a weakness of FDR. Mm. And so Ickes was very much in wanting to save all these places. Uh, so one was what today is Kings Canyon National Park in the Sierras of California. And the idea there was let's take this vast acreage and make it a wilderness, meaning no roads. Mm. There, the Wilderness Society was born in 1935, and the idea was if you build a road, then telephone lines come in, sewage, and da da and it gets commercialized. Um, if you just block it off, no roads, and it's only for hiking in, walking in. So they come to Roosevelt with the proposal, and they had found a young photographer, Ansel Adams, who nobody yet had known was a great photographer in the big sense. He was, and it was a little obscure booklet, but it was the photos he took of that area. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got him in to meet the president for a couple mm -hmm. minutes. Roosevelt looked at the book and just said, oh my God, 
course it has to be saved, but if it's a wilderness, no roads, then I'll never be able to see any of this mm. because he was in a wheelchair. Mm. Meaning, I need a road to go look at the vista. Yet, he then said that, and they just kind of sit there, and he said, well, let's do it. I'm, that will make it a wilderness. So he went ahead and did it, even though he knew he wouldn't be able to see what he was saving. And that becomes a big movement to stopping um, the areas where we keeping roads out of landscapes. It culminates with the Wilderness Act of 1964, which Lyndon Johnson signs, um, and and um, and you know by and did 9.1 million acres in wilderness continues to to grow. Um, but another one, a, a woman named um, a, uh, from Pasadena, uh, a name Mervana Hoyt. Or did the you know Rose Bowl parades and was a really a horticulturalist uh, at heart, and she wanted to save the Joshua trees in California. Everybody thought those as sort of ugly, shaggy trees. Uh, there was no conservation of Joshua trees. They were almost were treated as if they were weeds. Mm-hmm. And she started, got it, and photographed, and got to Roosevelt, and he said, "You want the Joshua trees? We'll create a, a million acre Joshua tree park." She was even startled. She's like, "Well." Their problem is, I, I just sold you on it, but there are railroad rights and there are these companies that sell mining rights. He's our lawyers will get rid of those. We're going to declare it uh, that. Mm-hmm. This is incredible executive power being uh, flexed on, uh, on the half of protecting um, American landscapes and, and uh, flora and fauna. And, um, you know, these are the la- examples like these stories of FDR are legion. Um, and it, in so much so that I will tell you that in the last year of his life, when he was starting to create the United Nations, he brought in old Gifford Pinchot, who was really up there in age. And, and with Pinchot, Roosevelt had the idea that in the UN, we would create one global standard for air, water, that, you know, um, uh, timbering, et cetera, meaning a conservation standard for the world. Mm. And he was pushing that. And all of the advisors around him were saying, oh, it's a little out there. No, no. He was, till the day he died, April 12th, 1945, he was going to get that through on his UN. And when he died, the Truman administration just said, we're not interested in that. That's nutty. Mm. There was a feeling often that the Roosevelts had gone way far you know, that they were visionaries on this environmental um, front. And just like we talked about downsides with TR and indigenous people, um, mm-hmm. FDR had a, a, an understandable weakness um, for dams. Uh, he wanted big federal public dams. And thank God we have these. It electrified our country. And he built the Grand Coulee Dam and, and uh, Tennessee Valley Authority in, in electrifying America. But... Um, Dams create problems for, let's say, up in um, the Columbia River, you know, for salmon. They can't get over those big dams. And this, this bothered Roosevelt because he didn't really, he thought fish ladders could get them over and the, 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 the fish couldn't. So it is, his solution is build a dam, but then on the other side of the dam, build a fish hatchery, mm-hmm. where then you could re-release. So he was always thinking about how he could, you know, balance the need for modernity, electricity, roads, automobile revolution, et cetera, but not damaging our, our country so it just became a place of, of you know, underdeveloped blight. Hmm. Yeah, he's, he's, he's really, again, visionary is a great way to, to say it. And I think he's, you know, I think it's, it, it was FDR that, for most uh, national parks is, is to have, you know, ramps. So people that are in wheelchairs can have access. So when, I, when I've been to Yellowstone and many other uh, national parks, you see that where people that are not as uh, able-bodied can able to, to, to also experience that. And I think that's important because, you know, all of this land that's preserved, you know, people, listeners might be like, okay, this is great. We can save animals and habitat, but what, what does this have to do for me? And I think that that's, that's just it is that this is, you know, everyone's country and everyone should be able to experience that experience the the natural environment we have, which is, you know, very, very beautiful. And, you know, really, you know, when you think about it globally, each country has 
many natural resources that are, you know, uh, or environments that are super, super uh, beautiful. And, and we do as well. And, and I think especially in Wyoming and, and Montana and Utah and, and Colorado and many, many parts of the country. And we have big thanks for, for, for uh, these, these, two, these two presidents. So I want to well, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say not only thanks for them, but then the, um, you know, the push as our country grows and we be, start, we're no longer a rural America. We're mm-hmm. becoming urbanized, uh, soon suburbanized. But the, um, you know, the, I, I think the impetus of, that Roosevelt FDR wanted to do was clean air and clean water. I mean, we had no environmental protection agency. I mean, there was nobody that, yeah. so companies were just dumping yeah. everything they could and, and raw sewage and rivers and we had health scares everywhere uh and so there's a movement uh and and air and water have to be federal in the end i mean you can't have yeah. a you know ohio um a top a law in ohio for pollution you know air pollution quality where michigan doesn't have one because mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. going to blow over you can't do air with states it's just like migratory birds you can't Mm-hmm. And a river, what good does it do if, uh, you know, um, for, say, Tennessee to have a, a you know, want to keep the Mississippi River clean if upriver, you know, Iowa's just dumping, uh, mm-hmm. you know, chicken uh, farm uh, residue and fertilizers in the river and killing it downriver. So mm-hmm. it, it all was the need, the drumbeat going on is the federal government's going to have to create air water qualities, species protection standards, hunting seasons, um, you know, where there, there has to be a way to, um, for the government to intervene so we don't uh, mm. destroy um, the, the gifts we have of this extraordinary country and, uh, filled with so many different uh, ecosystems and, mm-hmm. uh, and natural wonders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And I think that's important for us uh, as, as a country as a whole. When I've Travel in many of these places. I am very thankful that we have these things preserved to enjoy, but also that these are you know animals, uh, land, uh, you know homes, and many people that that have lived there for generations. Obviously, for Native Americans as well, and it's it's their home. We have to we we do I think have a, a, a duty to 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 preserve that. Okay, so the last book, and we'll use the, the rest of the time to talk about the last book, the more recent one. The first, just you know. <laughs> preface i have to this to this uh this book how did you do this how did how did you hit a home run with this book how did you do this this book is sweeping and it is fantastic you have everything in here you have you have jfk rachel carson Stuart udall you know uh, lbj nixon you got it all in here it's 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 remarkable it's a remarkable book um and i i'm when i was preparing for this i was it's like, man, this this is hard to even like get questions formulated. Much less, how did how did he write all of this? This is so fantastic. It's very fluid, very very much cohesive. Uh, really, really just remarkable. Um, yeah, how do how do you come with the idea for for putting all this together? And and you can kind of lead with the best way to kind of walk us through the book and the main messages here. Well, you know, times change, and while I documented. TR, FDR, there was a third wave. I call Theodore Roosevelt the first wave of environmentalism um, and the second wave, the FDR era, and the third wave. Uh, I, I would have loved it if it could have been just Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. My life would have been easier. But the, I looked into it, and the third wave really began in 1945 with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Once we developed a nuclear world and had nuclear capacity, um, things uh, rapidly changed. Uh, we in the United States from 1946 to 1991, we had detonated uh, something like a thousand, I think it's a thousand fifty four nuclear weapons yeah, uh, in right. testing, mm-hmm. putting all of that you know debris in, into uh, the planet. And um, you know, I also in this book, just to get it out of the way, give John F. Kennedy a lot of credit for engineering the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963, convincing the Soviet Union and Britain to stop the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere and underwater. And thank God we're still living by that extraordinary treaty, which is often seen as a, the high-water mark of Kennedy's presidency. 
and is certainly one of the great ecological accomplishments of any leader ever. Yeah. Uh, but you begin in 45 uh, because really Rachel Carson was working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife for FDR. She was a new dealer. She was from Springdale, Pennsylvania. She um, wanted to be a, something akin to a marine biologist. She ended up going to Woods Hole and studying oceans on, in, uh, near, near Hyannisport in Massachusetts. She, um, you know, got an MA in zoology from Johns Hopkins. She wrote about fish and other creatures for the Baltimore Sun. And then during World War II, she worked doing radio scripts about the oceans and about particularly fish and, and you know, an important um, food stock they are. And, um, and then she had written on eels and the like. But the big thing came, she started writing books, and she wrote, which I recommend anybody listening, watching, to make sure you read at least one of Rachel Carson's three books on oceans. She, mm-hmm. she writes these extraordinarily beautiful books about uh, ocean life, shorelines, and um, she also got very concerned with Hiroshima and Nagasaki about fallout and what it was doing to, uh, to animal life and, 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 human, and thereby human life. And also was concerned that, you know, and as FDR said, the Dr. New Deal had to become Dr. Win the War. And during World War II, we greenlit to factories to work around the clock, manufacturing every newfangled chemical marvel you can imagine. And uh, the, the, the proliferation of DDT to kill insects um, it was, was just sprayed all over the place, particularly in the Pacific because we wanted to kill mosquitoes, ticks, lice for our soldiers. But we then, after the war, without properly measuring the amounts that one could use, just started blanket spraying um, DDT over, over crops. And people would get cancer spikes, leukemia from DDT, the same they would from nuclear fallout. Those become public health issues. Uh, and that's starting to get married uh, with with the idea of saving parks and re- outdoor recreation and well, wildlife and all they, these there are two strands there and um carson will eventually um you know there becomes a huge case i write about in the book in the late 1950s with marjorie spock um she is the uh, sister of dr benjamin spock who was a great baby doctor also an anti-war protester of vietnam but she sued Suffolk County, Long Island, um, crop dusters, and you know, Department of Agriculture, because she said, "I'm growing organic food. I'm an organic farmer, and I these people spraying DDT over my property. I they're taking away my livelihood." Mm-hmm. Well, that case works its way to the Supreme Court, and Marjorie Spock loses. But FDR appointed. Um, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas from Yakima, Washington, an ardent conservation outdoors person, um, sides and writes the dissent, siding with Spock. And this gets a lot of attention. His, Douglas's dissent is brilliant. And uh, even though she lost, she gave all of the pay- documentation developed in the Supreme Court case over to her friend, Rachel Carson. Meanwhile, Carson had old friends from Fish and Wildlife in Pawtuxen in Maryland and all feeding her data about, um, about the dangers of DDT. And so she is diagnosed with breast cancer and is trying to run against the clock to stay alive and writes the book Silent Spring about what happens when we see what we're seeing kind of now with climate change, what happens when there is no bird song, when trees are dying, when you have drought. When you have the, you know, and the, and it, it, it was a, a, you know, a shot right across the bow to the um, big chemical. Because if, if big chemical thought if they go after DDT, they'll go after everything, meaning all these chemicals get regulated. And there was a formaldehyde scandal that happened. Uh, um, th- uh, th- um, um, formaldehyde, so, uh, sorry. Um, about women with pregnancy with chemicals. And so it became in the mix. And um, she's there to be the kind of beacon. And really the environmental thinking of today emanates really out of Silent Spring. 
and it because she's now looking at planetary health and looking at, at human connection of human illness and I must add what was fun about writing Silent Spring Revolution wasn't just having a strong woman figure like Rachel Carson, uh, which was fantastic for me to be able to do, but um, or Marjorie Spock and others in the book. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the number of pe- people ban- wanting to ban DDT, it takes a decade. It's called the DDT Wars. It goes on from 1962 to 72. When William Ruckel's house, Nixon's head of the EPA, um, bans DDT in North America, and Carson wins. She's dead by then in 64. But the other people fighting against DDT become, you start losing the, you know, the uh, white male structure of the Roosevelt eras, um, and really start getting into a more multicultural activist approach, meaning California. Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, uh, Helen Chavez and others were, were, were going hard against pesticides, saying that it was causing deformities and illness in uh, Mexican-American agricultural labor and Filipino labor and the like. Dramatic. The United Farm Workers Union is pushing for the banning of these uh, right at the time or shortly after Rachel Carson. And then people like Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King uh, you know, with nuclear fallout, they were leaders in stopping nuclear testing. In fact, Dr. King basically said, what good does it do to integrate a lunch counter in, say, Greensboro, North Carolina, if the milk we're drinking has strontium-90 in it, mm. chemical contamination from, from, you know, nuclear testing? Mm. Um, and, you know, I interviewed from my book Andy Young, Dr. King's great assistant, John Lewis, and they said the whole Montgomery bus boycott of Rosa Parks, the reason you didn't want to sit in the back of the bus wasn't because it's bumpy, it's where all the diesel came in, no air conditioning on the bus in the south in the summer, and you would be choking from the diesel. And and the point being, by the 60s I'm writing about here, we have environmental justice movement. We're looking at how we're putting our industrial debris and waste into neighborhoods of people of color, into Latino barrios or into the uh, black wards uh, or, or, you know, and, and this becomes a new consciousness um, effort born out of Rachel Carson in the 60s. And it really kicks in a new gear in 1971 when the Black Caucus is founded. And by 1980s, John Lewis, the hero of Selma and the, with the Southern, uh, with the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, that John Lewis of voting rights becomes a real leader in the environmental justice movement. Um, and so Carson springs all of this loose um, and turns environmentalism into a big pursuit to the point of being, I'm here at Rice University, but I'm, we're no different here than anywhere in America. Everybody does earth science, ecology, environmental studies, environmental law, everywhere. Uh, this is the generation. Rachel Carson's generation that was the one who started educating us about um, the dangers of of this hyper industrialization and cancerous growth and and developers who who don't care an iota about uh, water or or or, or, or land degradation protecting water um, properly or they they'll degrade landscapes meaning we're seeing climate. In, the, in, in what we're dealing with now. And so I'm hoping Silent Spring Revolution can show how that generation got through the Clean Air Acts, the Clean Water Acts, Endangered Species, created the EPA, Wild and Scenic Rivers, National Trails. It wasn't just great people. It was a movement yeah. from everybody jumped up. And that's what I try to do in the book. Yeah. Well, I have two final questions for you. I'm going to you touched on Rachel Carson a lot, and and she worked with Udall uh, and uh, and and Kennedy. And I, you, you're you're absolutely right. You give Kennedy a little bit more of his due than some people kind of give him credit for. Obviously, his life was taken you know very shortly, so it's hard to kind of measure his legacy. But he definitely has some wins for sure. Um, I'm going to skip over LBJ only because he's fabulous and he's fantastic on on a lot of these issues. There's other you know, issues that he has, of course, as well, Vietnam being one of them. But um, 
you know, he, he does a lot as well. But the one curious thing um, that may surprise some people is the inclusion of Nixon. Um, and Nixon, you know, first term is interesting. Um, you have the EPA, you have Earth Day, you have uh, NOAA, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Clean Air Act of 1970, you have OSHA, you have Clean Water Bill, you have the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I mean, that's a lot of really good legislation. That's a lot of really good stuff going on in, in first term Nixon. And yet, it seems that Nixon wasn't uh, some big environmentalist. Uh, it seems that the, the kind of, to your point, you were just ending with there is the, the, the excuse the pun, the climate that was going on in, in the political climate and, and where the, 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 the country was, was very much, this was concerning for them in terms of their air, in terms of their water, in terms of chemicals and really pushed for that. So that was of the moment. And he, he used the moment and he was able to get a lot of things done, not because he was some secret, uh, you know, environmentalist. Maybe just briefly, just chat about Nixon's kind of you know uh, stamp here on on the, on this legacy as well. You know, one of the things that interests me. There's a writer Wendell Berry, but also people like Ken Burns, the documentary filmmaker, Don Henley of the band The Eagles, that are really into Henry David Thoreau, and they'll sometimes ask. And now I've adopted it, and we can ask the people that are listening or watching. Oh, you know, the question is, what's your Walden Pond? Where, what, mm. what do you most love in the natural world? If, if you're going to be active to save a particular place, where, where is it? Mm. And the Kennedy was easy. His love of Cape Cod was incredible. I mean, save the Cape Cod National Seashore, love being on the ocean. Even in the Cuban Missile Crisis, he's doodling sailboats. and it, So he's Atlantic seaboard. Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson are the Texas Hill Country. Um, you know, the ranch, the Pedernales River, and, 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 you know, the kind of a frontier feel of it all. Nixon was a suit uh, living in San Clemente. I couldn't tell you what his, what his Walden was. Mm -hmm. um, that, he didn't read that kind of literature. He did admire Theodore Roosevelt, but everybody did in, a, in, in politics to a large degree. And so um, what, inner, what Nixon was was a transactional politician. And he was smart in 1968, a tumultuous year when Martin Luther King died and Bobby Kennedy died and Nixon wins. He gave the job of running environment to his domestic White House advisor, John Ehrlichman, most known for going to jail in Watergate. But Ehrlichman was a land and water lawyer from Puget Sound, Seattle, and he knew the game. Uh, he had stopped an aluminum company from building a plant near an NIMBY thing out in Seattle. It was a big deal. But um, so Ehrlichman's there in the White House, and Nixon's only present in about six days, and the Santa Barbara oil spill happens. Mm -hmm. And it was a catastrophe. Uh, television news like CBS, NBC, ABC only turned color in 1967. Mm -hmm. So now you're bringing in color paradise, Santa Barbara, with gook oil and birds stuck unable to fly and from all these camera angles and it was horrible and nixon wisely for after first hesitating that it may not be that bad out there got on top of it all and because he could blame the previous administration he'd only been president six days but he went out there and he looked around and he was from california and conservation was always in the mix out there so he knew knew it would have potency as in it as a you know with the public and then you know he got through that and then that summer when neil armstrong went on the moon when that should be all people are talking about mm -hmm. um time magazine's doing the cuyahoga river on fire in ohio mm -hmm. and the rouge river on fire in michigan i mean rivers on fire public outrage uh, dr seuss is writing about smeary lake erie and the death of the great lakes um and and Nixon Nat finds out Gaylord Nelson, who fought for a senator from Wisconsin who, who, who did much, but he, including saving the Apostle Islands, 22 islands in northern Wisconsin, that may be the prettiest park we have. But um, Nelson got the idea of a teach-in, an ecological teach-in, uh, which becomes Earth Day in, um, on April 22, 1970. 
And once Nixon knows that Earth Day is happening, and Nixon asks a key question, where, how overnight is every college campus having Earth Day workshops? And I'm seeing posters and ads. And where's the money coming from for this thing? And the answer was Walter Ruther, the United Auto Workers Union. That it was a weird moment where labor unions and the environmentalists were in tandem because unions wanted their workers to have clean lakes to fish, outdoor recreation near industrial cities. But um, so Nixon now wants to outbox the, the uh, Nelsonites, uh, the Ruthers, mm-hmm. and he does something very great on January 1, 1970, before the football games of New Year's Day. Unexpected, he signs the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, and that gives us what we call today environmental impact statements. You're going to go build something. How is it affecting the environment? The signing of that gives real birth to environmental law. So you don't go now to go study the environment at a college just to work at a national park or forest. You go work for ExxonMobil. They need environmentalists. The mm-hmm. Walmart needs them. Everybody needs them. Mm-hmm. And then he gives an incredible state of the union on, on the environment. And then he gives people an interior off for Earth Day. Nixon plants a tree that day. He also unleashed the FBI onto spying uh, and domestic surveillance of environmental leaders. But he came out of Earth Day pretty well. There was no violence. It wasn't really about Vietnam. It really was about learning about our planet. And that summer of 1970, Nixon, working with Senator Scoop Jackson of Washington and Congressman John Dingell of Michigan, uh, the Nixon White House, Ehrlichman as a spearhead, uh, they create the EPA. Mm -hmm. And it opens its doors December 1, 1970. And one of the greatest public servants I've ever read about, the conservative Republican from Indiana, William Ruckel's house, uh, ran it as a cop. He went and said, here are new federal laws, and every company's got to follow these laws. It was about implementation of clean air and clean water acts, endangered species. And he busted polluters. Mm-hmm. And in, in it, we started really creating an ability to have the federal government do what what it long needed to do. And um, Nixon also did things like create, you know, Golden Gate National Recreation Area or Gateway in, in New York, New Jersey. And um, he stopped the jet port from being built that would have damaged the, the Everglades. Uh, he, he created our first, um, you know, National River, uh, creating the uh, Buffalo River in Arkansas, which had been fought for by people like the painter Thomas Hart Denton. Um, you know, it, 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 he joined it. And in fact, the Sierra Club leader, David Brower, who was a radical left figure at heart, later was honest enough to say, God, we were wrong. We didn't give Nixon enough credit We were because we were angry about Vietnam. We wouldn't realize that we had a real partner. Uh, and at one point, Nixon met environmentalists and told them, look, you guys better wake up. You better get while the getting is good. I'm willing to do this stuff with you guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Nixon uses the environment, and he wins in 1972, the largest landslide election in American history when he beat George McGovern. Mm-hmm. And then, alas, endangered species get stunned, and, and then, boom, Yom Kippur War, mm-hmm. 50 years ago, uh, United States backs Israel, Arab countries unite, and we have an oil gas crisis, prices go up at the pump. And you start getting an energy lobby going toe to toe with the environmental lobby. And we've been in that paradigm ever since. And it eventually will divide between Democrats on the environment and the energy lobby Republicans. And that crossover that you and I have been talking about um, by and large vanishes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so, so interesting how we can kind of see the beginnings there. So, last question is, is uh, you can kind of bring us home here is. If we fast forward through time, you kind of mentioned it there, um, you know, there's been some, some progress, I think, done. Now, we, much of our focus is on climate change, uh, appropriately so. Um, I think first term Obama, he had the provided Department of Energy with the stimulus check, Secretary Chu with almost a blank check, I mean, to just do research on energy, conservation, on climate, so many things that were, was given in that first term for Obama. Obviously, recently, the Inflation Reduction Act of uh, 2022, 
Uh, I think that people have called it the biggest and significant climate legislation in U.S. history under President Biden, which is tremendous. Um, and yet, we we have this 2050 deadline. We have to get to, you know the the temperature down. There's so many problems, so many things going on. Do we need another two things? I guess with that, where as we move in the future, do we need another Teddy FDR or someone like that in the in in the White House? and or a kind of environmental justice movement so that we, we get both where people are involved pragmatically, not just, you know, activism is great, but that we have people pragmatically working with this, um, you know, kind of rolling up our sleeves and saying, how do we figure this out? And also having someone huge, uh, some, some visionary in the White House. Where, where do you see the future of conservation and environmentalism for, for the United States? Well, you know, I study presidential history for a living, and it's very hard. If you're not going to prioritize something like climate as a president, make it your thing, it's going to be hard to make the inroads we need. The problem that we're in now is large. It's global. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can do all the, the you know, CO2 reductions we want if China and is burning coal and building new mm-hmm. coal-fired plants, and India does the same and, yeah. and all of that. Um, so, I, look, these challenges are incredible. In the period I'm writing about, in the 60s and 70s, we were doing things like getting lead out of gasoline or, you know, um, going 55 miles instead of 75 to save some oil. Uh, there's a movement to get solar and wind going and all this. Mm-hmm. We now really have, it can't be a person. It's got to be a people's movement. And mm-hmm. it's there globally, but it hasn't quite hit the point that it needs to be. I think Biden has done, uh, if, when, if one's just going to pull back and look at climate presidents, Biden probably has the best record, but more money to it than anybody else. But does that mean we're weaning off of gasoline? No. Um, I think it's going to be more states than the federal government uh, because mm-hmm. California and Washington state are starting to have, you know, we won't sell vehicles by 2030 that um, are, you know, make gasoline. And you're, that's the kind of message that Ford and GM can hear. We're hearing until a big strikes occurred. Um, but, you know, if the auto industry and states, let's say 30 American states say we won't sell gasoline, we're not selling fossil fuels, it's an electric car state. Uh, I, I'm not sure that can happen. But if that did, that would cause it to move and out of the United States and might go abroad. Mm-hmm. But electric has its own problems, batteries sure. and mining. and. Uh, so there's no magic wand here. What, so what, what do we do? What I've learned from these three books comes, basically boils down to Roosevelt and David Brower, and which they said, have fun saving the environment. First off, do not be doomsday. Don't talk about ex- that we're dying, the whole planet's dead, we've screwed up. But wake up every day happy, believe. If you're in college, get a pizza, form a club, and you don't have to just do get off, f- climate work to save a local bayou, work to save a, a you know, uh, old strand of oak trees, uh, work to deal with wildlife corridors as species are moving from one zone to another due to climate, you know, work to get rid of uh, uh, infestation that are, uh, of, uh, insect infestation that are killing trees. There's so many things that need to be done. If you love the natural world, get involved. It might be one day a week. It might be you get join one one group. It might be you do a lot, but you know just join, be part of it. So when we're ready, when this climb, when we're ready, there'll be all of these people already engaged with environmental protection and wanting proper planetary stewardship. That it'll be able to be a Niagara Falls movement. It'll go large. Uh, we're at the cusp of that. So just get engaged in big or small ways, but don't get psychologically damaged over climate or anything else. It, it's not worth it. Uh, protect the integrity of your own soul and your own being. Be, be a happy warrior about trying to save the planet. You'll make friends and you'll, you'll exchange information. And, um, it, and that's how a movement is, is uh, a, a meaningful movement is, is hatched. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're getting close. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the conservation trilogy is the wilderness warrior rightful heritage silent spring revolution they're all available uh now uh through uh harper uh 
what can I say, Douglas? This was absolutely a big treat for me, uh, a blast. It was a big honor, a big privilege uh, to have you on and to give me so much of your time and your energy talking about these three masterful uh, books you've written. Um, anything, anywhere you want to point people to? I want to point the finger at you and tell you thank you for what you do, having a civic dialogue, uh, reading books, talking about different issues, caring about humans and, and their souls and, um, you know, how to, how to um, grapple with all of the boxes of modernity that we're having to deal with and, and, uh, in this age of reckless social media and, you know, bad cable news, um, having a, a kind of civic forum like you present is a, a wonderful thing to do. So I treasure your podcast and, and the kind of experts you talk to and the issues you deal with and you're doing it because you're a person of, of love and integrity and I, I really want to uh, send gratitude your way for um, asking me to be on your fine program. Uh, you're, you're much too generous, much too generous. Uh, thank you for those kind words and thank you for coming on. I, uh, okay. I, I really, really appreciate it. Bye guys. Bye.